Welcome to another episode of Chess Recommends. Today we are going to talk about Millennium Mambo from Hao Xiao Shen, a Taiwanese new wave film from 2001. So some context before we get into the film. I think this is one of Hao Xiao Shen's most popular films and it's my personal favorite from him. And I think it's actually fairly different than many of his other films. I think this has a bit of a faster pace than some of his other films. And this is a very Wong Kar Wai like film, like stylistically it has those neon lights, that kind of free flowing narrative and visuals that it's very Wong Kar Wai, but many of his other films are more like Edward Yang, I would say that it has that slow cinema element, very slow pace. Everything looks like very natural. It has lots of still shots and stuff like that, but this is like a very free flowing film and i think often his most acclaimed film is a film called the city of sadness that's always in the sight and sound lists that's a film that's actually really poorly available but i think i read an article fairly recently that it has been restored to 4k maybe like a year ago two years ago so there's a chance that maybe it comes to criterion or kino lorber or something so that would be amazing as it is a great film and and he has also many other films that are pretty poorly available, even though he's a very consistent filmmaker and makes these kind of slice of life films. And I think one of his main inspirations was Yasuchiro Ozu, which you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily see it in Millennium Mambo, but you see it in many of his other more kind of traditional slice of life, more naturalistic films. And maybe you can see it a bit here, but we will get into that later but yeah this was my second time watching the film i still loved it and i would maybe rank it in my like the bottom of my top 300 or something and yeah this was also restored fairly recently altes has the kind of recent blu-ray release of it the print i watched i think was an older print but it was still like a good looking print and now I'll give a plot synopsis. So it's about this young woman, Vicky, and we follow her life in like beginning of the 21st century. But she actually tells us through the narration that it's actually, I think, the year 2010 or 2011. And she's looking 10 years in the past of her young life and how her young life was and how she's kind of nostalgic, nostalgic about it. So there's this narration at some points in the film where she talks about herself her younger self and yeah the film kind of follows her and her boyfriend how how and okay, the main characters he means wiki name is wiki and they have a very toxic relationship how how is a pretty toxic guy a very controlling guy and again they are doing drugs and partying constantly there are is in this kind of goals and aims and structure to their lives that much and then she also has relationship with a guy called jack so there's this kind of a love triangle and most of this film is uh, situated in taipei in taiwan but there are also these snowy moments in hokkaido japan which look really nice and actually that brings a big contrast to the film when we have this neon light Taipei and then we have this kind of more rural Japan with snow and very natural looking background. So that's an interesting contrast. And maybe there's some conversation there about modernity tradition, like many of these films seem to have, but we'll talk about that later. But that's basically the plot. It's young people partying and having relationship conflicts and stuff. But anyway, Altes. What did you think of this film? It's your first Ho Xiao Shen film. Whether it's a good starting point, I'm not sure, but I think it's a fairly accessible art house film. Yeah, it's a beautiful film. I absolutely love this film. So, yeah, it was just, it's one of those that for me, it's like from the first second, I was all, I was all in. Uh, it's just, there's, there's just a feeling that gets created and, 
as the story starts, it's just it, it's a story. It's a kind of story and journey I very much connect with, and I just love these kinds of explorations um, because we all have that periods of our life, and you don't quite know why they happened. Why you know why why you got yourself into a situation why it progressed that way why you couldn't find your way out or why you couldn't resolve it with that person or the two of you couldn't find your way and of course it goes beyond all that but that kind of exploration that kind of looking back but looking back with perspective but your perspective may or may not be 100% uh, 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 accurate Overall, yes, the mood of the film, what it's about, like you said, the Taipei and then the, the uh, Hokkaido, and the, I just lo I love that film. It just left me with such a such a feeling as going through it, and then even at the end, uh, just really connected with it. Yeah, so I just realized there's one thing I forgot to mention in the context. So this is actually a very sad fact that. Ho Xiao Shen actually retired from filmmaking a few years ago because I think he's battling with Alzheimer's. No. And he seems like that old. I think he's in his 70s. So he could, like many people, still make films at that age. So that's very sad because he's one of the great directors that are still alive. He's an utter master both in terms of the visuals, but also in many other ways. So that's very sad. And I also mentioned Wong Kar Wai earlier, and I think it's fun that funny that I saw in your letterbox that you locked Fallen Angels recently, which I consider to be one of the best Wong Kar Wai films, and, and it's one that I need to rewatch. And I also know it's in Tony's favorites list, but I know that Tony's a bit bigger Wong Kar Wai fan than me, as he has like many Wong Kar Wai films in his list. I think at least Happy Together and Fallen Angels, and I only have happy to get there on my list, but Fallen Angels is a very good film, and I think that's a pretty good reference point, actually, to Millennium Mambo, like, stylistically and even plot-wise a bit, so. Yeah. Yeah, it just got me in the mood. I watched this film, and immediately I got in the mood. I was like, oh, now I want to watch, like, a Wong Kar Wai film, because you're right, aesthetically, while it's not, it's not copying Wong Kar Wai, it's doing its own Thing. It's, it's not like it's the same colors or anything, but there's a mood and there's a feeling, and you know that feeling that exists in one car. Why cinema? And this, it's just this moment in time, and people are journeying, and the moment seems, in some ways, it seems epic and endless. Like it just exists in its own universe, and it can just be looped over and over, and there's that feeling in the one car why and. Honestly, with Fallen Angels, I didn't know. Like you said, like I've shared before, I don't, I don't really quite know how to rate. A lot of times I, I feel like I love discussing the films. And in the discussion, you kind of talk about what's important and what's interesting and whatnot. But in terms, I don't really feel like it's my position or I do it too well to give it a star rating. So while I said that with Fallen Angels, what happens to me usually is I'll give a star rating but then I'll be still processing the film and I'll still be thinking about it. So I feel like, oh, Fallen Angels as well probably has already grown in my estimation from the moment I finished seeing it because it's been sitting there in my mind and I keep thinking about it, uh, just like this film and just like uh, Heroic Purgatory. So um, my position is the journey with the film doesn't really stop at the point that you give it a star rating or whatever or a thought it lives with you and then like all art and then your estimation as you think about it more, it's going to change drastically. Yeah. And I think it's interesting how, again, we combat this to one car vibe, but like I said in the beginning that many of how she films are like stylistically very different to this. And mm. those films really don't feel like one car vibe at all. Again, as they have more naturalistic colors, and at some point in the podcast, we will probably talk about the flowers of Shanghai. And I think this is a bit different film for Hao Xiao Shen as well. This maybe also has some Wong Kar Wai vibes to it. 
And also, I'm sure we will talk about Von Karvai in the podcast at some point. Do you like, again, happy to get there is one of my favorites. So we'll probably talk about that one. It's a great, great, great movie. But I think maybe we should now talk about a bit like like for whom we would recommend this film and then we can get into the spoiler discussion. So I think, well, most people have seen who follow this channel at least one Von Karvai film. I mean, most people really laugh in the mood for love, for example. It's one of the most highly rated films of the 21st century. Everybody who has seen it pretty much loves it. So I think if people who are watching this podcast love that film, for example, I think you would probably like Millennium Mambo. And if you like that kind of neon light visual style, I think you would really appreciate this film. If you like films about relationships and modern day alienation and things like that, I think people would like this film. And I think it's a fairly accessible film for art house mm-hmm. film, even though the structure is a bit different with the again the narration and then it's just a very free flowing film in general even though it's still like very clear like what is happening and that there isn't that many characters in the film and so i think it's fairly accessible film and it also feels like very modern it's like 23 years old and i think it fits perfectly into that turn of the century which the whole film is also about so i think Many people who are into art house at all would probably like this one a lot. Yeah, I'd agree with that. Yes, it's um, yeah, it's 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 very accessible, and yeah, all these kind of films. If you're into like like you said, exploration of relationships, or you know, people at a young age trying to discover themselves you know, make mistakes, maybe end up in an ideal relationships, but also in this, in a way, uh, concrete jungle, jungle, like you're, you're, you're in the big city, you're living in small apartments and there, there, there is a romanticism, uh, to this kind of lifestyle you're, you're trying to chase. That's not really thinking about where it leads and where, what the future, uh, can be. And then, yet you're then encountering some very heavy truths about life and, and people and learning about different people's challenges and even depending on where they come from. So uh, it, it, yeah, it's a, it's, it's a lovely film. It's very accessible. It's very beautiful. So, yeah. Yeah. So now we will get into the spoilers, but I will say, like I say with many of these films that I don't think it matters with this film that much if you are, spoiled even though it's kind of like a plot heavy feel and there is a clear plot to it and stuff but there isn't this like like who's like plot revelations or plot twists or something that you shouldn't be spoiled about but again i know people are heavily against spoilers usually so if that's the case you shouldn't watch the rest of the chat before you watch this film yeah so maybe we should start with the aesthetic as we often do. Like, I, I mean, I already talked about it quite a bit, but again, the neon lights are a very big part of it. It's a very colorful film, although it's not like like very bright in a way that there's lots of these dark corners and shots and the lights can be like fairly dim. And again, there's a strong contrast between darker colors and brighter colors and the camera also kind of flows very freely you mentioned in the beginning that you kind of were hooked to the film from the start and i'm also very much hooked to the film like in the beginning scene when we see the main character wiki walking through this i guess it's a tunnel and we are shooting from her back and there's just this Mm. dreamy hypnotic quality to it and when she narrates like it just instantly yeah. throws you in like a almost like a fever dream or something that just hypnotizes you yeah. instantly and you just it's instantly sets the mood like a cute soul song or something that you instantly 
Oh, that's the, yeah. This is a film for me, and I'm going to love this film just from seeing that woman's like, like back back of her head and stuff, and just that moodiness yeah. just throws you in. And that's very impressive, obviously. It's not easy to set a mood like that. It's actually very difficult. And I think that's a problem, for example, with many American films that they aren't often able to do something like this other than maybe David Lynch. Mm -hmm. 100% it's that I don't know if that's called the tracking shot or, or or not where you're just following the person but yes like that it's like immediately mesmerizes you and like you said this is not easy to do because I feel like that kind of character as well is not always relatable someone who's kind of freewheeling and just kind of going with life and 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 being a bit romantic about it and is being a bit naive but you just can't help but feel that affection towards the character so you 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 see her in this moment and it's following and the, and there's the narrative in the back that's kind of going against what's happening there right you know she is talking about this obviously abusive stalking boyfriend that doesn't that's going to basically constrain her Yet we are seeing in our in our, this moment of freedom and happiness, and her hair is flowing, and we're just walking, and we're just tracking her from the back, and she's turning around and she's looking. It also makes me wonder what she's looking at. The audience, what what is she looking back at? But it's just this lovely feeling, um, and you feel this ex affection for her. You you see this beauty in her personhood, her yeah, her her um, optimism, maybe her excitement, uh, her fun, and then obviously, then the world gets created of this nightlife because it's like the focus is on a lot on the nightlife, like you said. So the music, um, the vibe, and the vibe is created by these lovely, like you said, like neon lights, but not Wong Kar Wai, like because those are very unique to. Hong Kong in the time period he's shooting. This is more modern, more loungy. Uh, you're in a lounge. There's a DJ set. There's there's that. But then there's also creates a feel, feeling of an insomnia and relentlessness because it's like night after night. So it's keeping you up. You it's it's making it's making you weary. It's like tiring you out as well. Uh, so it just creates such a lovely aesthetic that's what's attractive and exhausting which goes to the themes of the film that youth that excitement that parting it's both exciting and pulls you in but it can be a trap and it can be exhausting it can wear on you and it can lead to some serious questions so the aesthetic really goes well with what the film's about and then it serves as a nice contrast as with how the aesthetic is when we get to japan and and that part of the film yeah, I think the soundtrack is a big part of the aesthetic too. Like we hear lots of dance music of that time. And yeah. then there are these more like ethereal pieces as well with vocals that just add to the mood mm -hmm. so much. And I think the soundtrack is just absolutely killer and so fitting to the film. And again, I said in the beginning that, that, um, this film stylistically visually is fairly different to many of his other films. So many of his other films look very naturalistic. And to give a reference point to an earlier film that we talked about on this podcast, Still Walking by Hirokachu Koreda. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a fairly similar visual style than many Hao Shen films. So very beautiful still shots, very bright colors but not very colorful but just very naturalistic like i've said many times and then edward yang's films like i said are a good reference point also i know you've seen a brighter summer day i think and yi yi we mm -hmm. will talk about in the podcast at some point and yi yi is a, like a very good reference point to many of his how other films 
But yeah, su- such a beautiful aesthetic, and that's probably my favorite thing about this film is just the aesthetic, the mood, the soundtrack. I think this film works well, even if you don't think about the teams, even though obviously we will think to- talk about the teams and stuff, but you can just watch this film, let yourself go and feel the mood, the aesthetic, the music, and it will be a masterpiece just based on that. But then there are many teams to this film, and I feel like the teams are something that many of many of the films that we've talked about on this podcast share. So teams relating to alienation, modernism, how or postmodernism in this case, how can society is moving forward, life is changing, how it's very hard to be in your early twenties when you feel this aimlessness. And also in your teenage years, I mean, I think that okay, Vicky says that she met Hao Hao when she was 16. And then she also says that when she was graduating or want, wanting to graduate from high school, she would have had the final exam, but Hao Hao didn't wake her up and didn't want mm-hmm. her to go to the exam because he thought that if she graduated from high school, she would leave him behind and actually progress in life, but because how how prevented Vicky from graduating high school, she um became part of this loop, this aimlessness that where life doesn't progress anywhere, but you are just standing still partying, doing drugs and drinking, having sex and not like really trying to make your position in life better in any way. And I think many people can relate to that how you have these illness, even nihilistic, very hedonistic lives. And I can really relate to that as well in many ways that although the aimlessness isn't usually or not always a select choice, but because the society around you, you don't see many ways forward. So you become aimlessness because you have that anxiety of future progresses, progress and different paths for you and those paths can be non-existent they can be very rocky they usually aren't very nice for the average person so those are very relevant themes back when this film came out when we kind of again this was the period when we started talking about like late stage capitalism which we for example talked about when we talked about the sopranos and it's still very relevant in the 2020s, perhaps even more relevant when we, for example, perceive in the world that there are so much, many people go through anxieties and depressions and things like that. And it's like a really alarming thing that such a big part of the pro- population goes through things like this. So it's a very timely film still to this day, something I can really relate to as I'm in my 20s. So many of these things are something that I also think about constantly. I have the same type of anxieties and things like where the life will go in the near future and long term. So it's a film that many people in their 20s can like and also people who are older who remember their 20s and think that, oh, yeah, it was like that for me too. Yes, 100%. Uh, percent. I, I agree with everything you're sharing there. There's this dialogue in the beginning well, when she's doing the narrative and she says, Vicky says, uh, okay, how how one said to her, you came from a different world into mine. That is why you don't understand it. Now, that in itself is like a very profound statement about the film itself because i do feel like the film is meant as a bridge of people coming from different worlds whether within taiwan or in the larger world helping to understand each other's world and and again like that that beginning I, it was very powerful for me and and how you appreciate or or you have empathy for this for Vicky, because Vicky is obviously doing something very reckless in a way. Like you said, she she's dropped out of high school. She's like living with this boy. She's left her family. 
the boy is clearly violent, uh, you know, with criminal tendencies, um, you know, estranged from his family. But at the same time, we also have empathy for how how because we we kind of sense that there's something behind his angst and his problems and his issues so he is looking for a kind of understanding that maybe vicky can't give him but maybe it shouldn't be vicky's place to give that to him because she shouldn't have to suffer for what he what he's what she's not responsible for and then how how has to kind of take his own route to his own salvation. So it's very much about, like you said, being trapped by these forces, but helping prevent judgment because it's easy to judge someone and say, you're at this age. And I can also understand from exists in many cultures, but I always can relate it from an Asian culture perspective that it's very much at this age. And what's your future going to be? And how do you plan to live? And how do you plan to earn? And maybe v Vicky and how how they are they are now in a system where they don't know like you like you said they don't know how they're going to exactly earn a living maybe that problem they're not responsible for because that's a system that they've been kind of born into and they're stuck in and maybe some of their odysseying night odysseying is about for a little while not having to think about what the rest of their life is really gonna gonna be because it doesn't seem that exciting or that promising or something to look forward to and the excitement the lure and the excitement of the current moment with the nightlife with the partying with the hanging out with friends and you know doing drugs and whatnot and even young love and and you know first sexual experiences and all that is is, is much more captivating and i'd rather uh be there and then of course we have this introduction of this character jack who's representing a little bit of something else so um i agree why you can relate to it and i can see myself um in some of the questions and the journeys and the confusion these characters are having and even some of the problems like even including how Yeah, and I think again, I can also relate to the escapism angle that you were just talking about. That I mean, I don't party, I don't drink or do drugs, but I escape through art. That I listen to albums, I binge watch TV shows. And I think that yeah, I can binge watch these TV shows this whole week and not think about studies or something. And yeah, we I can put them to the future. And yeah, I'm gonna finish my thesis. I'm going to start doing it probably next week. I'm going to just indulge in this art now and I'm going to get my act together next week. And then it kind of becomes that loop when you are just constantly doing escapism, you are procrastinating about the future. You aren't necessarily traditionally lazy, but it's that anxiety that prevents you from doing things that you should be doing. And I was also going to mention that this film I think tells us a lot about perception, or like how we perceive other people. Because when you see Vicky, she's obviously extremely beautiful. She's young. And when you see a person like that in the street, you like immediately think that, oh, that's a perfect person. I'm sure that mm. she has a great mm. life. Again, okay, she's beautiful, young, has everything mm. going for her. But this film just completely destroys that illusion. She's actually a very wounded individual in a toxic relationship with a violent guy who doesn't have a, like any life prospects or anything. He's very controlling. He destroyed her studies and everything. And they don't really explain in this film why Wiki feels so strongly for how how. They have this on and off relationship and she always returns to how how and of course that's the case often in real life with relationships i can even relate to this myself that i know certain relationships in my life are toxic and that i would be better without them but you in a certain way get addicted to that misery 
and that toxicity, mm-hmm. which is obviously very dark. And that's kind of was what we talked about when we talked about the Japanese music album and the song Hitogavari, which is about toxic relationships and how you actually start craving it when you experience that you get addicted to the love, love that is full of blood and misery and violence because that's the only thing you know and you hate yourself so much that you don't actually want anything good to happen in your life that you want to be miserable because you think that you don't deserve anything else and that's something that we also talked about in the a silent voice discussion a little bit so many of these films have strong relations to each other lots of reference points already actually funny that this cycle of recommendations it's the kind of 10th as just recommends episode so it's kind of a milestone that we have done this wow. 10 times now so and already we have so many connections wow. between these films even though we haven't done this in the end for that long of a time again 10 episodes for four months approximately but yeah so i'm actually now that we are talking about this film realizing how much i related the wiki character mm. in so many different ways both the toxic relationships the aimlessness the escapism having anxiety about the future and also feeling nostalgic about certain things in the past it's actually very interesting when we see her in japan for example towards the end that she seems to be way happier there so what does that tell about her that the grass is apparently greener in japan it feels like that, that when they're playing in the snow and putting their faces in the snow and they seem all happy and everything is beautiful, the landscapes are beautiful, the mood is beautiful, everything seems happier. So, yeah, yeah I that's a very interesting part of the film and it was uh, to me a whoa moment like i'm like okay uh who's Jiao sen is being critical now of in a way taiwan or the situation in taiwan for the youth because and i don't know if that's my reading of it or or not but i i could see that because it made me think of even uh some things where when people were talking about living in the projects, like in in in, uh, in the U.S., and there's even rap songs where they'll be like, "Oh yeah, like I don't see any grass, like I don't see any trees, like because it's this concrete jungle," and so clearly there is this this promise of the city. Okay, there's a city, and there's this nightlife, and there's this fun, but is it more appealing? because you don't know what else is really out there uh, when that's all there is around you. And there isn't a prospect to kind of get out into nature and all that. And obviously Taiwan even currently is very much invested in creating green spaces in places like Taipei and stuff that have been built in a very concentrated way without the green spaces and all that. And they're trying to figure out how to do that now. So definitely, like you said, there are some similar themes where we, we talk about this you know the late state stage capitalism like the overgrown like city everyone's kind of moved there looking for a future and now is a generation where it's like they come to the city there's nothing there you're you're kind of stuck there you're kind of journeying um whereas in japan now stands in opposition to that or at least hokkaido does because it's now she gets to be out in nature. She gets to be freer. She's away from some of these constraints. And in fact, Vicky's kind of struggle in, I guess she would be in Taipei, in, in Taiwan, is, I don't know why, but it weirdly reminds me of Naked, like Mike Lee's Naked, because it's this, he's like kind of coming into the city and he's just like stuck and it's just people just faring around, but there is no there's nothing promising there's nothing hopeful there's nothing soul connecting um there but you know jack seems to be the one kind of person despite being someone who's supposed to be an organized crime actually has a heart and 
you know, seems to be looking out for her like a bigger brother because she doesn't have any family looking out for her. There's no family to come help uh, how how in a way to um, his dad is literally just ready to put him under arrest for stealing his Rolex. So that's a pretty harsh relationship we can imagine with the father there. Yeah, and I think kind of like you said that maybe it's not about Taiwan, Japan, but it's more about just escaping that prison that is the city. And it may be just that city versus like rural area stuff that we are mm. maybe would be happier in a smaller town with snowy landscapes, small restaurants and things like that rather than trapped in a huge city full of people who are all alienated. And this also film is, of course, very fragmentary, both in terms of visual style, but also like how we explore her mind through these very free-flowing scenes. So it, in that way, it reminds me of Heroic Purgatory a bit, and that in that way, it makes this a pretty good double appeal. Mm. Yeah. I think who you know, would applaud you though, because you said that earlier about escape, escapism, but you say like you kind of escape through art. And I mean, I echo that. I think that's something I felt is something to be learned. And hence why I even created a channel called Cine Art Therapy, because it was a form of therapy for me. And it was something I had to learn that this is, uh, something that can be healing and helpful. And I think that symbolism, that celebration of cinema was lovely because yes, she goes to, she goes to this Yubari festival. She's there on the Yubari. We see the iconic posters of these classic Japanese films that we all love or, you know, know of and, and, the, and, and the snow and then being away from the city. And so maybe you're, I mean, I believe you're right. And that's what I felt. She's learning how to heal in a positive way. She's also learning constructively to kind of find her place in her world. And her place in the world does not need to be confined to a country or a particular city or even a particular culture. So I think that connects with that quote that I said that, you know, you came from a different world, but that's why you don't understand it. But maybe this is opening worlds. It's saying just because you come from a certain world, that doesn't have to be your world. At any stage, you can leave that world. And I think that's something we we have both experienced in our lives because maybe we came from certain circumstances, but through discovering these things, our world's expanded, whether it's education, whether it's learning, whether it's art, it's film, it's, it's that. And then you got to occupy worlds that you wouldn't have imagined you could be a part of which makes that whole thing with back and forth with Hokkaido a few times. First time she kind of goes there and then goes back and then kind of goes is something I could really connect with. And it was really touching and, uh, and beautiful. I really enjoyed seeing that in the journey of her character. And from the narration, we can feel this sense of nostalgia and longing for the younger years of this escapism and stuff and we can see that in this recklessness there is this sense of like it can be very cathartic and very beautiful and memorable and nice and healing for a person to just say that yeah i'm gonna live my life recklessly and not think about the future too much yeah, I think the escapism angle is definitely the main theme of this film, at least to me. And it's just so relatable, like we talked about. Like, I, for example, yesterday had like one of the most profound kind of escapism and like art experiences I've ever had when I listened to this art pop album from the 90s by Janet Jackson called The Velvet Rope. Oh, like yeah, for the, yeah, I like, listened to that for the first time, and oh. like I, that was actually the best first time listen I've ever had yeah. in my life. Like, 
the first three, I was like in tears in the first three minutes when the title track is the after the short interlude, and yeah. it starts like beautifully and utterly. And I don't know why, but I just was so touched uh, with that song, and I was in tears like multiple times throughout that album, and I listened to it again in one sitting, even though it's a very long album, seventy-five minutes, and and it was just such a beautiful moment that I think I will always remember. It's like very in, insane that after listening to thousands of albums, now there is an album that was the best first time experience ever. And I don't usually consider albums to be all time favorites after a first time listen, but I think I can say with this album already that it's an all time favorite and I listen to some of the songs again and it, it is so. So that's just the escapism angle reminded me of that as it was such a beautiful moment for me. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I, I, I can see that. And that's an amazing album, an iconic album. So I'm, I'm really glad that you had that experience with it. But yeah, and 100%, you're right. That, that's like woven in because what's also interesting is that in her nightlife, her passage to Japan or her experiences that she's going to have there go through her nightlife thing. She's working as this waitress. She she meets these uh, uh, Tekochi te brothers. They're like DJs. They're this, but they happen to be half Japanese and they're like, you know, come with us. So I, I also like that aspect with the escapism, but also the you have your troubles and sometimes it's about little doors that open up, not big, huge uh, vistas. But one thing can lead to another through that music. There are these guys, they're the music. And then culturally, they're also half Japanese. They also are connected there. They go there. And then, of course, they, they, they live somewhere where there's this film festival is iconic. So little doors are opening as she finds her way. So it's very much like Alice in Wonderland, too, in a, in a way. Because you're there and you're trapped and you don't know, quite know what's going on. And then, then little doors are opening to as you awaken to yourself or so you can further your search. And like you're saying, like with this album is, you know, as you journey, um, I can totally connect with that feeling. Because even watching this film, I felt that I'm like, I've seen so many films, but how is it that I can put on a film still? and have this amazing magical experience and be like, I thought I've seen everything, but wow, this is so beautiful and, 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 and unique. And it's, you know, saying some things so well, like, how does that happen? Um, makes you really appreciate art. I don't want to go again about Janet Jackson because it doesn't uh, like, no, you like, can, yeah. This, yeah, but there's this song called what about in that, all about man it's actually about like janet and a toxic relationship with a guy and yeah he's like talking like what about when you shamed me what about when you were violent and things like yeah. that so it kind of reminds me of like vicky's relationship with how how yeah how he like claims to be loving and decent but then he's very controlling and awful and violent and so there's a bit of a similarity between that song which I absolutely love that song, by the way, and then this film. But yeah, I've kind of lost my train of thought when I think about that album. But, but I, I, I don't think that that's surprising that you're connecting this album with this film because this album, in, in a way, was very much a certain period in Janet Jackson's life because I was like a teenager when this came out. And it was a very significant album for her because obviously her youth was tied with her family and her brother and all that. Then she had that rhythm nation and those kinds of things. Or she was kind of like this pop darling, but velvet rope was something where she's asserting herself. She's coming to her own. So these talk, these relate, and she's openly talking about, like you said, it was a big thing even at that time, because she was openly discussing these, uh, you know, traumatic re relationships or, or abusive relationships she's been in. She's, she's being, she has a different kind of awareness and awakening. And then she's bringing greater sexuality into her music too, because, you know, even uh, the way love goes, you know, like a moth to a flame burned by the fire, 
you know, it's very much Vicky's experience too. When you're like, why did she find how how? Well, it's a moth to a flame. There's 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 some part of love and attraction that's kind of interested in self destruction, or it doesn't realize it is, and it can be pulled in by a fire, and you could be kind of destroyed, or there can a metamorphosis can happen, or there's a realization you're burned by the fire, but you come out of that fire something anew. And, and you have greater perspective, and then you can talk about that. So I think I see the perfect connection between the album and this film. Janet Jackson is being kind of like Vicky in the film from the beginning, kind of talking about going 10 years back. And how, where was I 10 years ago, and how did I kind of get here? Uh, so I feel like your, your brain makes really good uh, connections, even though you feel like you're digressing. I, I, it makes perfect sense to me why you're discussing the two themes together because they very much connect yeah the veil of a trope is obviously known as her like most introspective album yes where she's very vulnerable and she talks about sex for example very openly and combats homophobia and things like this very kind of mm -hmm. taboo topic topics that many people especially more conservative people wouldn't accept but that's what makes the album so emotional and what makes this film so emotional that there's this sense of vulnerability and honesty. Mm. Although mm. I think with this film, unlike with the album, there's this sense of illusion in this film, kind of like there was in Heroic Purgatory, that yeah. the film is so fragmentary. And as it is narrated by the person who went through it, we don't necessarily know that when yes. she looks back at 10, ten years, that is it all, did it like really go this way or is it? like her memories, kind of like in Solaris yes. by Tarkovsky. There are, we have these memories, but the memories aren't actually how it really happened, especially mm -hmm. when we look back at like a decade or several decades in the past, the memories are have been corrupted mm -hmm. by your brain. So is this actually the whole story? And should she actually look at this period so nostalgically when we as a viewer kind of are in a way detached from the from her life, we see the drugs, the alcohol, the violent uh, boyfriend, all the abuse, the aimlessness, no future prospects. But she, for some reason, looks at something like this nostalgically and in a very happy way. She longs for that. She wants to go back to her youth. But then we outsiders can see that, yeah, that's not a good life. That's not something that you should feel nostalgic about and you should be glad that you have been able to escape a life like that so there is definitely that kind of corruption of memories but then in the velvet rope that's like completely opposite that feels like fully authentic and honest but this film you can interpret in a way that maybe it's all an Ill illusion silencio no high panda yeah true i agree with that uh, I can see that as well. And uh, there are also these, uh, the vulnerability, you're right, the way the vulnerability is captured is amazing. And even through events and plot points, like when the police arrive uh, at Ha House House to do the search and how she's just confused, like she's, right? There's a part of you who's like, no, tell them no. Like no, they can't search, and they're, they're imposing themselves on her. So you you're feeling the vulnerability of her power powerlessness in this military. In a way, this police strong police force, and I I don't know about exactly the situation in Taiwan, so I don't want to speak to that. But you can feel there that Hu Sen is is saying something about this world it's a, it's a it's it is a scary world the police have the power she has no power as a youth um and then on top of that some of her protection is coming from in a way someone involved in the criminal world so she's really tackling some of very difficult things uh and then she's this like you said 17 year old maybe 18 later on i so she's still very vulnerable and then there are also times where she's very being very 
for lack of a better term, almost annoying in her indecisiveness and confusion and, and her moods and the way she's acting even in Jack's house almost irresponsibly. And he's showing her this great empathy and patience that we as an audience in some ways don't necessarily want to show her. We're kind of like, dude, like you have to figure out your life and you got to kind of get on with it and you got to get away from this and you got to figure this stuff out. And you're getting a kind of helping hand here. And why are you treating his house this way? And why are you being so demanding? Um, but Jack is not being that way. So then that helps us learn something about our own biases. And maybe we should, we need to be a bit patient and understand how vulnerable she may be, why she may be as confused as she is. No, I think we can also look at this film through like the gender lens, like when we yes. look like pretty much all the men in this film are corrupt in mm -hmm. some way. Of course, she has to work as a an hostess and we see it as like middle-aged men. They are like looking to go see these young, beautiful women and stuff. And then and how, how is a awful guy, then Jack. Is a mobster, so all of these guys are toxic in a way, and we see that even in this modern society, women have to do work like this, like in a hostess bar, mm. to get money and stuff. And there isn't maybe as good of prospects for women as there are for men, and men are still like completely controlling women and do not letting women be free and having mm. the full agency that they could have so there's definitely a bit of that in this film as well mm. yeah definitely definitely yeah. but i think yeah. it's not maybe as strong as the escapism mm. angle and the youth mm. angle and things like that and obviously in some ways this is a very like liberal feeling, feel, I mean, there's like the sexual politics and the ex expression of sexuality in this film. But then we see how the men are again, very controlling and conservative in a way. So there's a bit of these clashes of like modern ideas of relationships and womanhood and sex and then tradition. Like there are many of these films, like we talked about with Osu and even with heroic purgatory so and they, this is like something that is like very staple in japanese films but i think also in other asian countries like south korea and taiwan so mm -hmm. yeah and another so, point and another point actually that i forgot to mention earlier when we talked about like japan taiwan hokkaido taipei is that I think I read somewhere, although I might be wrong about this, but hopefully I'm not, but I think I read that Ho Xiao Shen is, even though he's Taiwanese, that he actually thinks that China and Taiwan should be unified again. Oh. That kind of maybe adds a bit of a oh, that's interesting, interesting angle to this thing that Taiwan, Japan, rural city thing and and of course, that's a very relevant thing now that there's constant threat about that maybe China might invade Taiwan. And like there's been con constant talk about it since like Russia went to Ukraine, for example, that whether that will happen with China and Taiwan. And some people also think that China should do it. Some people think they shouldn't. And then there, obviously, what, what will the US do if that happens and everything? But, but yeah, that's just something that came to me kind of when we talked about these teams so so that's uh i mean that's really um interesting that point because yeah then you can really speculate and say is he kind of saying that like um vicky taiwan's kind of like separated from this culture that it shares with china so it's like and it needs to almost recover that culture and it, in japan it's like stands as an example of how they have maybe 
still have a sense of culture, a sense of history, and then Taiwan's kind of lost, and all it really has is this cities are built up but without, without the culture and, and the history. I mean, this is pure speculation, but that, that's an interesting thought maybe. I wonder. Uh, also him kind of homaging Wang Kar Wai, who is a Hong Kong filmmaker, and obviously we know what happened with Hong Kong. Interesting. I mean, interesting things. They may or may not be there, but it's always fun to think, wow, I wonder if any of this kind of factors into the story he's, he, he's trying to tell. Um, maybe not, but uh, it's always fun. I think probably many people in the turn of the century, when you, obviously people are thinking about big ideas then, that, oh, it's the next century, will the world end? Will we get flying cars and whatever, whatever things like that? Then maybe they were, many people were thinking that maybe in this century, China and Taiwan will be unified. Mm. And of course, that period was also for like mainland China, like a very big period. It was after Mao, after the Tiananmen stuff, like it was like quite a few years after that, but it was still something that people talked about and remembered. So, so yeah, lots of like political angles that one can think about. I think Tony has actually visited Taipei. I think he mentioned oh. once that he's been to Taiwan. It's obviously one of the more liberal places in, in Asia. So I would love to visit it as well, but Ho yeah, hopefully, yeah. or like we'll see what the China Taiwan thing will be. Yeah. Yeah, very interesting. And yeah. If Tony's seen the movie, or when he sees the movie or sees this podcast, maybe he can educate us a bit more about. Uh, yeah, modern... he watched it last okay. year. Actually, so. Oh, okay, okay, okay. He wrote a, a small review on Letterboxd. Oh, okay. I, I should he, read that. Yeah. I think he called it like. Anthony only for postmodern oh, yeah. audiences and for the 21st century yeah, because obviously that, has yes. that alienation thing. So, and also kind of how like the city environment and things like that industry industrialism can affect your psyche and seem like the enemy. Like we see in Anthony only films, like the alienation trilogy and after that. So, yeah, and the whole search for identity. And I can even see the symbol, that idea, like when we were talking about that, you know, uh, mesmerizing first scene shot where we're going with her with the camera. Yeah, yeah. It, it creates that same kind of feeling that, uh, like, I experienced in, like, La Ventura. Uh, obviously, I still need to see other Antonioni, so I can't fully speak to that, but I can see that. I can sense that kind of uh, kindred spirit there. It's actually weird now. I was thinking that Heroic Purgatory and Millennium Mamba actually started in a very similar yes, way. I do. think Heroic Purgatory, like there's yes. the woman walking in the parking yes. lot. That yes. It's really weird shot because it's like cut. Yes. We don't see down here. We just see the head and then the like the roof and stuff. It looks really weird. Yeah, but, yeah. but then in Millennium Mamba, like we talked about, we see her from the back and she's walking through a tunnel. So it's actually very similar in that way and i didn't like consciously think when i picked these films as the double bill that they would be like that similar but actually they are very similar both have that very deep psychological identity thing and stuff and even some similarities in the visuals so it's pretty crazy how that seems to happen like unconsciously that i pick films that are very similar and even the album that we are going to talk about Mm -hmm. It's very oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I felt that too because I watched Millennium Mambo and then next day, or quite soon after, I watched Hirok Purgatory. And so the intro scene, I was like, oh, that's interesting. There's this similarity in the intro. And then one thing we didn't mention in Hirok Purgatory is like, and then she opens the garage and then the light, she like, just dis disappears in the light in a way but then there's a point we were talking about where the guy pulls the garage door down so 
really interesting uh, things in, in both films, like you said, and definitely the whole identity aspect is there, the alienation aspect. And also, like, I think Nash, the ideas of nationalism and stuff like that are where they're in love and terror as they're in, probably in this film, based on what you're saying, and definitely are 100% there in heroic purgatory. So lots of similarities. It's funny how this box set kind of could be like Millennium Mamba, very strong yeah. colors with a young woman. So yeah, yeah. it's kind of very similar in, in that way as well. So. Yeah. And by the way, people, if you can get your hands to this, whether it's this old box set release or the standard release, you, you yeah, guys definitely should. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, very nice release. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Yeah. But I think we can slowly start wrapping up the Millennium Mambo chat. I think we've covered like the major themes and the aesthetic quite well. And yeah. even that tangent with Janet Jackson ended up being like a relevant thing. And I'm glad that I was able to talk about that experience because I was thinking that I need to talk about it at least in some video. So mm -hmm. and I will probably talk about it more, more at some point, but we'll see. And like I said earlier, we will definitely return to Ho Xiao Shen and also Taiwanese cinema in general. And again, Edward Yang, we will do at some point, and then Wong Karawai, happy to get there some, some time. And Chiming Liang is pending. Like Altes now has three Chiming Liang films on Blu ray Rebels of the Neon God, Viva yeah. Lamour, and Goodbye Dragon Inn. So I think at least one of those should be still sometime this year. And so Taiwan is a very interesting country for cinema and kind of a cinematic powerhouse. In, many ways and they seem to focus on doing the type of cinema that I happen to love a lot. So. Yeah, uh, I'm very much uh, interested, uh, excited to explore Taiwanese cinema so far. I'll, like you said, um, I've only seen like two Taiwanese kind of films, but I re I'm really been liking the style. So I'm like very curious to see, okay, and very interesting explorations and themes. So I'm like, uh, diving more deeper into different filmmakers and different films will be, I think, really a worthwhile journey. And it feels like the Taiwanese films take more influence from Japan than China. So it's, it's actually very, it's interesting, very interesting, like, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm glad that you enjoyed this film and Heroic Purgatory and it was a, both of these chats went really well, in my opinion, and it will be fun to look back at these and um, see what we said afterwards and digest the things even more so. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, now I could give a quick update about the schedule. So next time we will talk about Andrei Tarkovsky's Stalker. So I see that's going to be great for Altes to finally see that for the first time as it is definitely one of the greatest films of all time and and then there is a great Italian movie as well a special day that Altes has on Criterion so that's a such a great film and actually I think even that has like similar themes than the films that we talked about today I guess it's situated in Mussolini's Italy but that's not necessarily the main point about it. It's more like a micro level film about two individuals. So yeah. Mm -hmm. And then wow. after that, there will be like Korea stuff. And but the schedule might actually change a little bit for August because there are lots of great films in cinemas nearby for Altes. So we might change the schedule a little bit. But the films that are there now will still be talked about, but maybe. Some of them might be postponed a couple of weeks or something, but we'll update you more about that when we know, but we might talk about Werkmeister harmonies in August, so we'll see. We'll see. Exciting. But yeah, thanks for watching. Let us know what you think of the film if you have seen it. Don't drink Coke at all. Sayonara and arigato gozaimasu.